Medical Center. Uh, Ms. Dankowski received a bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, in anthropology from San Diego State University, and a master's degree in museum studies with San Francisco State University. She's been with the San Diego Archaeological Center since 1996, leading the effort to preserve our archaeological legacy. She brings an understanding of curation issues and museum management to SDAC and has led symposia on curation throughout the state. Ms. Stankowski has worked extensively with local American Indian nations to promote cultural use of curated collections. She also seeks new and innovative ways for the public to connect with the past, including exhibits, seminars, and school presentations. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Cindy Stankowski. Thank Go you. ahead, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate um, being able to present in front of this esteemed group. And um, I hope this will tell you a little bit about the prehistory of San Diego, as well as a little bit about the San Diego Archaeological Center. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. There we go. Is everyone able to see that now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Lo lovely. Um, almost every day, somebody tells me that they didn't know there was any archaeology in San Diego County. And I tell them to open their eyes. This, the San Diego Archaeological Center has been here uh, up in the San Pasqual Valley since 2002. There's our website right there. And um, I think my slide was a little bit out of order because after I say open your eyes, I say we even have pyramids. And we even have a stone, we have castles and even a Stonehenge at UCSD. I've been to the real Stonehenge. I don't know if any of you have, but it gets pretty exciting around the solstices when the new agers come out and drink a lot and frolic. It's really quite interesting. The, the San Diego Archaeological Center was founded in 1998, basically to preserve artifacts and share them with the public in ways that they can understand and appreciate. These were our uh, lovely poppies a few years ago. I don't know if it's ever going to be like that again because it just has not rained, has it? How long have people lived in San Diego? There were a couple archaeologists, including George Carter, who wrote the book here earlier than you think. And he believed that humans had lived in San Diego 30 or even 50,000 years ago. This, is, this was the age of the mastodons. And in the background there, you can see some camelids. Um, and even uh, a giant ground sloth. But the archaeological evidence really isn't here for that that long ago because during that time, most of San Diego was underwater. So unless you were a mermaid, you weren't gonna make a good living. <clears throat> um, things started changing in the new world with two discoveries that happened in the early 1900s. I believe that humans had only been in the new world for about 4,000 years. And that was it. And then in 1908, they found this point, uh, the Folsom point, uh, nestled in the ribs of an extinct species of bison. So all of a sudden, okay, people had to have the death stone point. Remember, there was no carbon-14 dating then. Um, we, we only had to go with skeletal evidence. Uh, carbon-14 dating wasn't uh, widely used until the 1960s. And then in the 1920s, again in New Mexico, uh, a gent discovered this huge point with the bones of an extinct species of mastodon. So that Please put it. humans here much longer than had been suspected before. But how long had they been here in San Diego? 
the very first evidence we have for um, people in San Diego dates back to about 12,000 years ago. And it was discovered at the Harris site, which is in the San Diego River Valley. And so archaeologists called this the San Diego tradition. And they made a wide variety of stone tools um, that included the big scraper that uh, dome-shaped object you see there, and quite a few different kinds of points. The other little thing there that looks kind of like a puzzle piece is actually a spoke shave, which would have been used to make a, a shaft for a spear nice and straight and smooth. Malcolm Rogers of the Museum of Man fame was credited with discovering a geologist by training and had a civil engineer really and had worked for the railroad for several years and he understood the a basic geologic principle called the, the rule of superposition generally that means that what's on top is younger than what's on the bottom and uh, so he dug this huge trench which OSHA would not have allowed you to be in today. Uh, and he discovered these stone scrapers and he called them the scraper makers. But then later on, it became known as the San Diego tradition. These tools had sharp edges and they were probably used to say, take the meat off a hide or um, uh, scrape bone, for example. They could have been used for choppers as well. They also made a wide variety of points. And it's not really understood why were the different points good for different animals, different prey. We don't really know. They used local stone. Um, that sort of greenish stone is called Santiago Peak Meadow Volcanic. And it was laid down during the Cretaceous period here in San Diego. And it's found all over the county. These people undoubtedly made tools of other things like wood and bone, but they just don't last that long in the archeological record. Um, what else? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, about 7,500 years ago, there was an, a, an intense period of drawing in the region. So we don't see any sites dating after 7,500 years ago with this, these kind of tools in it, probably because the people left to follow their prey. Um, climate change then as is in, um, for people to move around. The, the little scrapers that you see on the bottom there that look a little bit shiny, they are made from a local shirt that's only available one place in, California, in San Diego County, and that's on Camp Pendleton. But we find tools made of that all over San Diego County. So it was obviously traded and used quite a bit. About 7,500 years ago, we have a whole new different kind of assemblage in the archeological record. An assemblage is a term that archeologists use to describe the same kind of items that are found together over time. These people, instead of living in river valleys and hunting large game, had a, a very um, maritime dependent uh, lifestyle. They utilized about um, 23 different species of shellfish. And we see um, the, the scallops here is from a shell midden in the La Jolla County. And these are just big giant piles of leftovers from a seafood dinner. One of the most common tools during this period is a chopping tool. And you're, you're saying city that's just a rock. Mm -hmm. But if you look carefully on the raised surfaces, it looks a little whitish along there. And that's called stone bruising. And that's what happens when you pound a rock against something hard, like a bone, and it crushes some of the softer minerals in the stone and uh, um, leaves that kind of mark on it. So we find these uh, in quite a few La Jolla period sites. They also had grinding implements. Not a lot, um, not a lot of work went into these. They usually just chose a piece of sandstone and grabbed a nice round rock as the handstone. 
We don't really know for sure what they were grinding because sandstone doesn't preserve protein very well for us to get an idea. Um, but they could have been grinding some plant materials. Um, anything that would have been nutrient so made points that are smaller than in the earlier period, but still too big for a bow and arrow. These might have been taught uh, attached to an, uh, an atlatl. We're not really sure. Um, and then you can see a nice blade there um, on the bottom. There's also this really weird tool. And these are found from Santa Maria, and we, we call these donut stones, <laughs> um, and they're about that size and shape of a regular big old Krispy Kreme donut. And these took a lot of effort to make. You had to find a rock that was nicely rounded, and then you had to poke a hole through it. And they did this with stone tools. They had no metal tools. So starting from each side, they would pound a sharp stone down into the middle of that, you can see it's kind of concave. It would be concave on the other side. So they venture that these might have been fishing weights. However, that doesn't make a lot of sense because why work so hard on something that you might very easily lose if your line should break? Instead, um, there were some examinations done on the inside of the hole. And what was discovered was something called silica sheen. And plants all have silica in them. It's what helps the tree stand up straight, or blades of grass stand up straight. And it's really a quite um, hard mineral. So what we think these were actually used for is a digging stick weights. So you had a nice big pointy stick and you shoved it through the donut stone point sticking out and this would give you kind of more oomph you know um, other plant material you could even maybe get purchase on it with your foot um, like like you would a shovel so it's interesting that these are found all the way up and down the coast and the material culture meaning the artifacts that were left behind from Santa Barbara down into Baja California during this period are very similar. So it might have been a, a culture that was quite spread out and related to the Chumash that um, uh, I just lost my total train of thought. Um, hi, Cindy, uh, just a quick question. Um, sure. if, do you happen to have all your other tabs closed on your laptop just because we're getting some interrupted sound going on? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, it might just be the connection. Okay. It, it might be, so, or sometimes we're a little weird here. Okay. Then about 3,000 years ago, there is a severe period of dryness that hit the region. And we know this from pollen studies. It's a field called palynology. And what archeologists do is we, we take dirt from an archaeological site and we float it. We put it in a column of water and the, the, the organic materials that are lighter are up at the, are, tend to float. So we scrape those off and look at them under a microscope. And if the uh, pollen is related to drought resistant species, then we know a drought was taking place there. So these people had formerly lived in the desert, and they're the ancestors of the Kumeyaay people who are here today. And of course, it was pretty hard to make a living in the desert with a severe drought. So they moved into this area from western Arizona and um, around the uh, Colorado River. And for the first time, we see pottery. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And we see a lot of dependence on grinding. And that the ground stones that they used are a little more sophisticated than they were in the past. And for the first time, we also see arrow technology. Um, and for the first time, we see obsidian. And there is no native obsidian in San Diego County. The closest obsidian is out at Salton Sea, and it's not a very good obsidian. Um, since I know some of 
fever scientists, I'm, I'm uh, laying on the science a little bit thick, but we have a way of sorting that are in it. Um, so they've managed to sample a lot of the different obsidian uh, objects that we have here in San Diego, and they correlate to some uh, obsidian found up in the coast of something that was treated wide and far because it was such a good material to work with and made a very, very sharp arrow. And here you see three little arrowheads made up again of that Santiago Peak volcanic and, um, and then a little arrow straightener. The, the thing that was interesting about the arrows is they were two part arrows. The tip actually came off so that I could stay in the animal. And then the shaft fell out because a little point. So they wanted to save those. And this is the first time we see pottery. And it's very difficult to date the pottery because it was made the same way for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's, it's rather clever um, how they uh, in, invented pottery, but not every culture does. Um, and it's not a matter of they were less intelligent or what have you, but the reason pottery appears in the archaeological, the reason pottery appears in cultures is usually conservation of water. So for example, up in the Pacific Northwest, they have baskets that are waterproof and can hold water, but they never had to make pottery because water's everywhere. Here, it was really important. It was also used for storing food and other um, personal items that you didn't want rodents to get into. This is how pottery usually looks when it comes to the archaeological center. We have a rim piece. We can measure that on a special chart. And we can also take a look at the composition of the clay. Um, and there's been some work done um, here in San Diego by um, actually um, Professor um, John Hildebrand at um, Scripps Institute on sourcing the clay um, from around San Diego County. We're getting a better picture of that. There were some preferred places to go and, um, and find your clay. They also made um, ornaments for themselves. It doesn't mean that there weren't ornaments in the earlier cultural periods, but we haven't found them. Um, perhaps they just disintegrated over time, but they made beads out of shell, bone, wood even, and um, it's interesting to find a group of them together and, and understand, you know, it's something like personal um, from that person. And we have uh, basketry. We don't have basketry preserved in the archaeological record very well because it just disintegrates over time. Every now and again, you can find an agave sandal or something you don't really find this, but we have indirect evidence of basketry. And here you see a little piece of clay with a basketry impression on it. Those little ridges correspond to the basket, um, the coiled basket that's kind of in the middle there with the uh, whisk on it. And the, the way this would happen is that uh, during this period, acorns were in a very important part of their diet, that these people uh, practice a seasonal migration and they went where the food was. In the summer, they were down at the beach. In the fall, they were up in the mountains because that's when the acorns were ripe. Um, in the winter, they would go out to the desert for resources. So they had an, a very diet. Um, and uh, anyway, back to the piece of clay, um, acorns, if you've ever taken shelled one and taken it apart, it has a, a husk on it, kind of like a Spanish peanut. But it's very, it's adhered very good. So what the women would do is smear their baskets with, with mud, and then they put the shelled acorns in it and hot, and they put in hot rocks or coals and swish it around. And that would burn off um, that nasty skin on the acorns that could later then be processed. 
Egg, processing acorns took a lot of work, but it was highly nutritive. So they went through the effort. So after time with these hot rocks or coals on this clay, it would actually vitrify just like pottery. And I'd like to think that maybe this was one of the, I, one of the things that happened that gave them the idea of pottery. Um, seeing how clay could harden and then become, it doesn't melt. Um, you can't necessarily stick it in fire because it'll break, but it's pretty heat resistant. So that's kind of an interesting thought to think of. Then in 1769, things really changed for the Indians. The, the, the friars and the soldiers got here. Um, before they even got here, their impact had been felt through North America, mostly from the spread of disease, um, smallpox, STDs, uh, just influenza, um, the diseases that the Europeans brought, the Native Americans had absolutely no resistance to. Plus, the Native Americans thought these guys were crazy because they had a very healthy diet with their seasonal months to them to stay in one place and grow. And it's now been generally proven throughout the world that when agriculture is adopted, the quality of life actually goes down initially because you're staying in one place. So that means it's easier to share disease. It's um, you have um, you have you have uh, toilets out in the around the location, which relying on just one food source makes you very vulnerable if that food source should fail. Think of the potato famine. Um, but eventually uh, the Spanish won and uh, were able to pretty much change the way of life for these people forever. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the archeological center. As I mentioned, we're out in the San Francisco Valley near the Safari Park, curate archeological collections. And curation is the care management and use. And care means that the collections are organized and accessible. Um, this is one of our storage vaults that shows the, the boxes of artifacts that, um, that we have. We're up to over 700 collections now and about 7,000 cubic feet of materials. Uh, remember, most of the artifacts are very small. Um, we don't have much that's really big. I came from the medical field, so these kind of uh, collapsible storage units were something I was familiar with and turned out to work really well. Uh, management of collections means that they're organized and accessible. We have student interns as well as community volunteers who come in and get to work with the collections. We call it archaeology without the dirt. And you get to see more artifacts in a day than you would a week in the field. And you don't get a sunburn. I always get burned. Um, and use means we use the collections. We have exhibitions at the center. Um, this, the uh, tree that you see there is, a, is at our entrance. And I did this mural to impress upon kids. Take me long to gather up all this rubbish to put in, a, in essentially underground in the future. And then you can see that little poster there that, des that um, describes how many people used to live on the earth and how many people are there today. And the three R's we want them to go away with is reduce, reuse, and recycle. We also have uh, workshops, uh, a lot of K through 12 programs that are just picking up again after COVID and uh, lectures. The, the picture with the gal holding the, the rock with the goggles, we have well, a stone tool making class uh, every year. And it's harder than it looks. I mean, there's a trick to it. A lot of people leave there thinking, well, I would have to be a vegetarian. Yes, you know? And Dr. Phil Gazinski, who's also called the Stone Age Doc, um, has given us many lectures. And they're always so very interesting from a medical perspective. He's a retired pediatrician. And one year around Valentine's Day, we had the health benefits of wine and chocolate. 
and we actually had wine, red wine and chocolate for people to taste. And he says he's on the red wine and chocolate 12 step program. He's never more than 12 steps from it. We also have a native plant garden, which has been suffering quite a bit. We never had native before because we, we were using native plants. Um, this one year we had owlets. We had three little owlets that came that hatched and they were so adorable. They, they were rotten at catching gophers, but um, they were so cute up in the tree that all snuggled together. And we have loads and loads of hummingbirds because we maintain feeders throughout the year. And I have another funny story. We had a, a visitor from uh, Australia who came and she went outside and she came back in and she says, you have the biggest bees I've ever seen. And I realized she was talking about the hummingbirds. And I forget that hummingbirds are a new world bird. They're, they're not in here or in Australia, but I've been to Australia and trust me, they have gorgeous birds. And that's the end. <laughs> uh, this is a, the bottom half of a, what was called a penny doll or a frozen Charlotte doll. And um, it says Nippon on the back, which means Japan. So this doll was made before World War Japan on them. And then here's some information about the archeological center, including our website, my email address. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions.